So good afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about the Senza PDN trial. This was a randomized control trial that we participated um, <clears throat> with patients with peripheral diabetic neuropathy. Uh, and this is a, a really important in indication because these people suffer from uh, loss, large losses in their quality of life. And whilst we can treat these patients with pain analgesics, um, often these therapies aren't effective. So in this trial, what did we do? Well, we took 216 patients in the United States across 18 centers, and they had to have their peripheral diabetic neuropathy for at least a year, um, in spite of taking usual care medication. Um, they also had to have a pain vas in a zero to 10 scale where zero would represent no pain, 10 would be max pain, and they had to be at least 50% on that scale. So what we did was to then randomize them to continue with what would be their usual medical management, which in this case would be analgesic treatment, um, or randomize them to usual care plus a new technology that I'm very excited to talk to you about today, which is called spinal cord stimulation. In the patients we recruited and those who received the spinal cord stimulator, they demonstrated much improved um, levels of pain and quality of life compared to the usual care group who virtually did not change their level of pain um, or their quality of life compared to their baseline assessment. So what I'm gonna focus on in this presentation is what happened after that six month period. Um, and one of the things we did in the design of this trial was allowing patients to cross over um, if they fail to get therapeutic um, benefit from, their, from the therapy they were receiving. And given that, we observed 90% of patients elected to cross over from their usual care to receiving a spinal cord stimulator. What we then did was to follow up everybody um, for a further 18 months. So we looked out at their data to 24 months. And what we found was very interesting. And essentially the improvements that we saw at six months were continued right the way out to 24 months in both the group who received spinal cord stimulation at the outset, but also those that crossed over and received a spinal cord stimulator at six months. And of course, the importance of that observation is that these benefits aren't just short term, but indeed are sustained over um, a two year period in, in those who received a stimulator from the outset. And that's important because of course, when you do these kind of trials, one of the things that can happen when you're measuring patient reported outcomes are, are placebo effects. So are, are these improvements we're getting in the, the stimulator arm just purely down to people knowing that they're getting something additional to their care? Well, usually those placebo effects um, tend to dissipate um, in the longer term. So the fact that we now have this longer term data, um, I think you would agree provides further support that this intervention, spinal cord stimulation may be an effective one for this population of people with painful diabetic neuropathy. So what are the implications then of these findings? Well, the first one is that we need to recognize that spinal cord stimulation is not a routine therapy currently available for people with painful diabetic neuropathy. Um, and indeed, if you look across the globe, whether you're in the United States, Europe, wherever, clinical guidelines do not currently recommend spinal cord stimulation. But of course, with this evidence, um, we would anticipate clinical guidelines being updated in the future to reflect this. But working on the basis then that we do have a therapy for patients, how might we make this available? So what would be involved? So first of all, spinal cord stimulation is a technology we've had available for oh, best part of three decades. And we've traditionally used it in the treatment of people with chronic low back pain. So we know what this therapy is and we know how to do it. So what does it involve? Well, it involves bringing the patient into the hospital after an initial period assessment. They will go into the OR 
And a little bit like a cardiac pacemaker, the technology is very similar. Implanted into their lower back under the skin is a battery that's attached to two leads. And those leads are then effectively implanted under local anesthetic into the, into the intrathecal space of the spinal cord. What then happens is, is that the clinician will then test with the patient um, on the slab, so to speak, to check that they've got the sweet spot where if they activate the stimulator, the patient perceives an improvement in their pain. Once that's done, we then close up the wound, so to speak, uh, and the patient is then allowed to go uh, out, be fully ambulant, and effectively undertakes what we call a trial period, which can be up to maybe a month, where they'll wear the device, we'll give them uh, a diary, ask them to re record their pain scores, and then bring them back. And if that all goes well, we'll then perform what we call a permanent implant. We will then finalize the implement implementation of the, uh, of the implant. And, and then the patient effectively can, can go out into the clinic, uh, out from the clinic and wear the device effectively during their normal activity. Um, what we've found in the chronic low back pain um, areas is that these people can get benefit from these devices over the long term. I've talked about 24 months. Typically, the battery life of these devices now is out to as long as eight, nine years. So we will certainly have to bring the patient back on an annual basis to assess them. And at some point, we may also need to change over their battery as well. But actually, that's a very um, simple procedure to do. We just do that again under a local anesthetic. So we've heard the evidence. How do I go about getting access to this technology? Well, it's important to say that the regulators, both in the United States, the FDA, and in Europe, have approved this technology as clinically, clinically efficacious and safe. However, in Europe and indeed in the United States, this technology is not routinely being recognized for either insurance cover or for availability within the UK NHS. For that to happen, both insurers and bodies such as the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in UK need to take the advice I've talked to you about today, examine the robustness of that, look at issues such as cost effectiveness, and then make a final decision on whether this technology would represent good value for money um, for populations, be that based in North America or Europe or elsewhere in the globe. So technology not available to the patient just yet, but we hope that that decision-making will follow um, in the coming months or a couple of years.